Okay, hello and uh, welcome to the Human Cell Atlas Developmental Stem Cells, Organoids, Models, and Regenerative Biology Seminar. This is a strange time we all live in where we don't get to meet and uh, we um, have to come together and here's our effort to build a community to keep everyone up to date on the most exciting science and to discuss together uh, where we should go forward. I think this is a particularly special seminar because one of the things that the HC has done, done in this whole technology is show what we can do directly out of human samples and just how much uh, richness we have and how much we can learn without perturbations. But something like development where access to tissue is hard and it's a very, very uh, dynamic process in a cell state and in morphogenesis, we really do need the ability to, to perturb and, and this is where all these amazing uh, organoid models and stem cells come in and, and it will be an important model system going forward to really understand development uh, from a single cell to a full human. And we have a, an absolute uh, fantastic uh, bunch of speakers. We're really lucky that such great people agreed to talk with us. Now, this is a very interactive event. The panel is important. The goal of the HCA is not only to give these amazing talks, but to get feedback from the community, to build a panel discussion. And for this, uh, we want you to participate. Give your questions on Slido. Please join Slido, um, you know, every one of you. Give your ideas. These will be incorporated into a white paper. Participate in, in, in polls. This is really uh, an exercise in community buildings, and we want to hear from you, your questions and your ideas. Um, so I don't want to um, waste too much time from our amazing speakers. So let's uh, introduce our first speaker. And we're um, very, very uh, lucky to have uh, Barbara Kreutlein here. And she's right now in, in, in Germany. We're all, all over the world. Uh, she's at the Max Planck and at the Munich Technical University. And Barbara might not know this, but I am a, a, a real fan. Uh, and um, I think one of her first papers, uh, when she was a postdoc in Steve Quake's lab at, at Stanford, really set, set the stage. It was a landmark paper that became the reference to understand uh, lung uh, cell types and all their different uh, markers and, and new transcriptional rules. And one of the things I really like about Barbara is usually it takes people time to get going uh, when they start their independent faculty, especially after a postdoc at you know, such a prominent lab like Steve's Quakes. But when you know, Barbara hit her own independent lab, that's when the innovation really sprung up. And using organoids, she demonstrated how one can, you know, first of all, the rigor of mapping it back to saying, okay, we can use these organoids. They recapitulate normal biology. And then, and now we're going to use them to really uh, use perturbations to, to investigate cell-cell interactions. And I, I thought that was an amazing paper, but I want to hear all the newest and greatest from Barbara. So it's yours. Anna, thank you very much. It's really a great pleasure and honor to be here today um, and share some of our ideas and work. So I'm sharing my screen now. I hope you can all see my slides. Yes. So, yes. Um, yes. So I, um, when preparing for this, I, oh, actually one thing I wanted to note is that actually I moved uh, to the ETH Zurich in Switzerland. So I'm actually right now in Switzerland and not in Germany anymore. Um, but it, uh, this is a rather recent move. Um, and so when, when preparing these slides, I thought, what, you know, how, what do organize, uh, organoids bring to the human cell atlas? And so, um, I think they very much enhance the human cell atlas. So this is the title of my presentation and I will show you how they could do that. And Dana already um, talked a little bit about that. So um, the human cell atlas, of course, has, has this goal to phenotype all the cell states that can be found in any human tissue and uh, doing that across a lot of different modalities. And so, um, I think it's amazing that we can make all these high throughput um, and detailed measurements on individual cells um, on human tissues and at the end integrate all these different modalities, trans transcriptome, genome, lineage, proteome, epigenome, spatial measurements and so on into an integrated multi-scale whole organ phenotyping map, which would be the, the goal of this, where we then really know for every cell, you know, what, what 
genes are expressed? What, how is the chromatin state in that cell? What are the neighbors of the cell? How does it interact with the other cells? And so on. And, and we cannot just only do this on healthy tissues, but on diseased tissues. Um, and in that case, we can then identify, is there maybe a disease associated state um, for, that we can find in the tissue? Is there maybe a, a cell state that is missing in the disease? Or is there, for example, aberrant proliferation of a certain subtype? And the goal is here really to have in silico virtual models of human organs. And, but what is missing here? And one thing is when we do these measurements on human tissues, the human tissue um, is gone afterwards. We cannot go back and manipulate it. Um, also, sometimes it's hard to get access to tissues of certain um, um, time points. Um, and, and so there are some problems. Um, and this is really where the stem cell derived systems come in. And this is really a, an amazing time right now where we can actually model human development in vitro. So we can take a somatic cell of an individual, um, for example, a skin cell reprogramming into iPS cells, um, induce pluripotent stem cells, and then differentiate those um, down to all kinds of different lineages that we find in the human body. But what is even more exciting is that you can use the self-organizing capacity of these stem cells to grow three-dimensional tissues in, in, in vitro. And these are these uh, um, self-organized uh, organoids. And um, they have now really, uh, so you can grow them from these iPS cells. You can also grow them, I should uh, mention that, um, from adult stem cells. Um, we are not so much focusing on this, rather on these developmental um, organoids that, that mimic the development of human organs, whereas here the adult stem cell derived organs rather mimic uh, maintenance and regeneration of, of human organs. And so the great capability of these organoids now is that we can generate them from any individual, any human individual. So these are really personalized. We can also generate them from individuals that have certain mutations and therefore show disease phenotypes. And so these organoids are specific to an individual and uh, once we have established a line from an individual, um, we can um, generate a lot of organoids. We can make time cost measurements for the same individual um, and somehow fill uh, time points that we have not accessible using uh, primary tissues. We can uh, manipulate these systems, which is extremely exciting. Um, and we can grow them in controlled environment. We can manipulate the environment. And they are also amenable to high throughput screening. So overall, um, um, organoids can therefore enhance the human cell atlas since they can complement the primary cell atlases um, in uh, the time points that we can measure in, in such that they can, we can manipulate them and really get at mechanisms. And um, so I want to show you this. Uh, um, in an example of uh, uh, an example organoid tissue that we are growing in the lab, which are brain organoids, cerebral organoids. Um, here are other organoid systems. I think they are all very, very much amazing. Um, these are other systems we are growing in the lab um, and we're, uh, we're also collaborating. Uh, Jason Spence is one of the panelists, for example, on intestine. We do a lot of collaborations. And so today I want to show you using these brain organoids, how um, using single cell technologies to analyze them, how we can um, uh, attempt to understand development and disease better. And so um, here is a, a, a cross section through one of these cerebral organoids. Um, this is a um, one and a half month old uh, organoid. And you can appreciate that there are regions like this one here that really resemble um, the human cortex where radial glia uh, progenitor cells are lining the ventricle and um, uh, uh, neuronal cells marked by CTIP2 are lining uh, the, the basal side and are found in the, in the um, cortical um, plate here. And so these organoids grow from IPS cells. We, we generate embryoid bodies and then go through different stages of uh, development. Uh, we push these embryoid bodies to neuroectoderm and then let them differentiate uh, by themselves into neuroepithelial um, tissue and that then develops into these brain organoids. And uh, we use single cell transcriptomics to understand this development from pluripotency to um, four month old organoids. And just to summarize this, um, in, in this um, network graph, we can see how cells go through um, the different states 
from pluripotency through neuroectoderm neuroepithelium into a progenitor state that diverges more and more um, as we move on uh, through time and then results in three or, or four major branches which we could identify as neuronal lineages of the um, dorsal forebrain or dorsal telencephalon, the ventral telencephalon, uh, the mid and the hindbrain and also some deencephalon cells. We also see astrocytes emerge at later time points and there are some mesenchymal cells that emerge. So this shows that these uh, brain organoids really um, develop all major brain regions um, that you would find in the human brain. We can also grow them from different human individuals um, and, and then make comparisons. So in this case, this here is a, uh, again, a um, force directed layout of a KNN graph for all these individuals integrated. And again, we see three major branches uh, that include the dorsal and ventral telencephalon and all these other um, subcortical regions. And um, we, we can then compare how genes are being expressed along the pseudotime from these progenitor cells, neuroprogenitor cells to neurons, and compare that across the individuals, which shows that expression profiles are highly um, consistent within a given uh, regional identity across the individuals. And so this um, shows um, that, that we can really use these tissues now to study um, the role of genes in the, as these different um, brain regions develop. And so this now comes the first point of where organoids become extremely useful, we can manipulate them. And so we can manipulate cell states, the states to understand the function of genes that we identify, for example, as marker genes or as important transcription factors as along a differentiation trajectory. And so here, just one example, we can take these pluripotent stem cells, we can knock out genes using uh, CRISPR genome editing. In this case, a transcription factor was knocked out and we have control cells that go through the same um, experiment but did not receive a knockout. And in this case, when we profile the Y-type and, um, uh, and the knockout organoids, we can again clearly see in the integrated data that there are the three major trajectories um, found in the organoids. However, um, when we look at these knockout cells that are shown here in, in magenta, they really only occupy the trajectories uh, to the ventral telencephalic neurons and the mid and hindbrain neurons. Not so, um, we don't find them on the, on the trajectory towards the dorsal um, telencephalic neurons, these uh, excitatory, uh, excitatory neurons in the cortex. And so this really shows that in this case, this transcription factor is required to generate cortical NPCs and neurons in humans. And of course, you can now imagine that you can, um, when you have a reference atlas from a primary tissue and you see, identify genes that, that are found in certain uh, cell populations or uh, uh, at certain pseudo times, you can really go in and see is, uh, is this gene important or not and what is the function of that gene. You can also do these perturbations in high throughput where you can actually um, use any of these um, perturbseq, crispseq, uh, cropseq um, um, ideas um, to introduce a pool of guide RNAs into the iPS cell. So in this case, we um, have a iPS line that has an inducible Cas9. So by uh, supplying DOCs, we can induce Cas9 expression um, and then Cas9 cuts um, at the sites uh, that the guide um, RNAs guide them to. And so in this case, we have a mosaic IPS um, um, uh, culture that we then can grow into mosaic organoids that contain both wild type and knockout phenotypes. And so then using single cell transcriptomics, we can detect the effect of knockouts um, on cell states. And, and this is just um, showing you um, some data where we, we did this and um, we, we knocked out um, using 60 different guides, 20 different transcription factors, and we can now go in and, and for example, here again, we see an effect of a um, switch, an enrichment of a certain gene knockout or a depletion of a certain gene knockout in, in a certain lineage in this case. Um, another idea of perturbation is, of course, that of um, disease and, and also there organoids lend themselves perfectly because you can generate iPS cells also from diseased individuals uh, that have certain, uh, for example, known gene mutations. In this case, we 
generated iPS cells together with Sylvia Capello's lab from um, individuals that had mutations in FAT4 and DUXIS. These are genes that when mutated lead to a malformation of cortex development. In this case, this heterotopia where um, a subset of neuronal cells fail to migrate to the cortical plate. And uh, in the MRI scan of the patients, you then see uh, foci of neurons located at ventricles. So we were extremely excited to see that when we grow organoids from these patient-derived iPS cells, we see the same effect that a subset of neuronal cells uh, marked here by MAP2 are uh, clustering at the ventricle, whereas another, the, the, the majority of neurons still manages to migrate to the cortical plate. Um, here in control organoids, all the neurons migrate to the cortical plate. Um, and so also here, then using single cell transcriptomics, we can identify um, what is actually the molecular state of these neurons that fail to migrate. And we see clearly that only in these uh, patient-derived mutant organoids do we see an altered neuronal state where genes are um, uh, dysregulated that are involved in neuronal migration, such as Robo3. And so this is um, an, another very interesting application of organoids. What we can also do, since we can manipulate these systems, we can trace lineages. And also we can culture these uh, tissues over time and really look at them with microscopy over time. And so in this case, um, we have uh, developed a, a tool to actually trace using single cell transcriptomics to uh, trace in, uh, individual lineages in, in high throughput in these systems. So we have an eye tracing vector that introduces a barcoded GFP into the cells. So this is a barcode that the cells have from IPS state. But then also we have uh, inducibly, we can uh, scar the GFP using guide RNA uh, targeting the GFP. And um, this can be read as another lineage marker. And, and so what we can then do is we can use these eye tracer cells to grow cerebral organoids. They all can, every cell initially contains a barcode. And then at any time point of choice, we can induce scarring and, and um, into, introduce a second lineage mark. And when we then perform single cell RNA sequencing, um, the data that we get, um, we can use to infer lineage trees. So for every cell, we can find out which barcode family they belong to um, and which scar family they belong to. And we can then um, really understand, for example, the time point of lineage decisions um, in these organoids. So when do cells decide to become um, uh, forebrain, midbrain, or hindbrain? And when do certain neuronal subtypes uh, emerge uh, and are specified? I'm sorry. Um, yeah, and in addition, of course, we have the transcriptomes of every cell, so we know exactly what the uh, state and, and, and um, uh, yeah, type of a cell is. In addition to doing these sequencing-based uh, lineage tracing experiments, what we can also do is we can um, put these organoids on a light sheet microscope and then image um, long-term, in this case, uh, almost two weeks, uh, the development of, of these organoids. And this is just a cross section through the organoid. Um, in, in, in principle, we have a 3D movie, but this is a 2D movie where you see how these ventricles form and how then um, these neuroepithelia form. And we can also now using these movies really track individual nuclei and um, establish these lineage trees by directly seeing cell divisions and, and tracking the, the nuclei in these, uh, in these movies. So this is another extremely exciting application of organoids. And um, so actually, I have been so far talking about how organoids can enhance the human cell atlas. I want to also talk about, and this is uh, something for the panel discussion, um, we can also enhance organoids by using the HCA reference atlas. So in this case, um, this is something we have been doing uh, for, for the last five years. Um, generating atlases of these organoids on one hand, but then using or also generating atlases of the primary tissues and then comparing the in vitro cells to these uh, cells from the primary reference atlas in order to assess how, uh, how well can we really mimic human development uh, in vitro and what is potentially missing. So if we do this, um, what we can, for example, get at is we can look at the cell composition of the primary reference and the organoid and what we might identify is 
uh, um, missing cell types, so cell types that are found in the reference but not in the organoid. So we need to then further engineer the organoid to really have this cell type present. Um, there could also be cell types that you only find in the organoid, and these would then be off-target cells that we don't want because they are not found in the, in the primary tissue. And this can help um, kind of reverse engineer and better engineer the organoids. Also, what we can do is we can uh, reconstruct differentiation pathways and um, uh, obtain pseudotimes for uh, tr uh, differentiation trajectories, align them between the in vitro and in vivo samples, and then really find out when when does the organoid start to fail in its maturation, for example, and which genes might be upregulated in vivo uh, when the organ starts to mature, but we don't see this upregulation in the organoid. And this will help us further engineer and, and push the organoids really to, to, to be an even better reference of, of, the, of human organ development. And so finally, I want to um, just mention some organoid cell atlas efforts uh, that are ongoing. So we have a, a CZI-funded uh, uh, seed network um, where together with uh, Greg Camp, Lucas Perkmans, Priska Liberali, Jason Spence, and Smita Krishnaswamy, we are profiling multiple organs from the same individual, so from the same um, developing human individual. But then from the skin of that individual, we actually ge generate IPS cells. And these IPS cells can then be used to grow organoids for exactly the same organs. And this can then be used to really fill, fill the time course for that individual, um, for, all the, for the development of all these organs. And of course, also seeing really the split early on in, in uh, the formation of the different germ layers and uh, the really early specification of the lineages. Uh, we also have an EU Horizon 2020 HCA consortium, uh, which is called Brain Time. So in this case, uh, the, the goal is to really do comprehensive multi-omic analysis of the human brain with a focus on mid and hind brain in development, adulthood, aging, and neurodegenerative disease. And the organoids in this case are really used as I promoted to um, fill in time points uh, during development, but also uh, use them as a a way to manipulate and really understand how certain gene markers are really um, meaningful or important for the um, development and maintenance of certain cell types. And there's another EU consortium actually that is um, called Organoid Consortium, which, which um, includes Hans Klevers, Jürgen Knoblich, Priska Liberali, um, Christoph Bock, and others. And so in this case, uh, the goal is um, to profile colon and brain organoids from um, 100 individuals for each of the organ types um, and uh, really provide a first um, organoid atlas. And which organoid systems to use, I think um, they are still trying to figure out. And so with this, I just want to mention that the HCA uh, has actually a biologic, biological network um, organoids. And so this is the platform where people that work on organoid atlases should uh, come together, discuss, and bring all this data together and, and uh, kind of um, put a common effort into, into organoids, uh, organoid atlases. And so in, in this case, the coordinators are uh, myself and Christoph Bock. Um, yes, and so for all the ones uh, now listening, if, if you are generating organoid cell atlases and you would want to join and discuss, um, yeah, just reach out to us. And so with this, I want to thank my research group, um, all the collaborators. It, it, I want to say a special thank to Gray Camp. He's also here in, uh, in Switzerland, in Basel. And um, we do a lot of, we push all these efforts uh, pretty much together. So you see also an integration of both our groups actually in this picture. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara, for uh, such an amazing talk, uh, both uh, instructive from the basics, uh, taking us uh, through uh, and all the way to state of the art. Well, we'll get a chance to ask you questions during the panel discussion. And uh, now it's uh, time to move on to our second amazing uh, speaker, Carl uh, Kohler. And, uh, you know, there, there are people who, who, who talk the talk and, and Carl walks the walk. He really wants to take these uh, technologies to, to actually impact people. Uh, his uh, goal that he's been working towards systematically is to enable those who cannot hear to hear uh, the Song of Birds and the concert by Mozart or Mozart's music. And uh, 
he started at the, the University of Indiana where he's done uh, much of his work, but uh, recently uh, moved uh, uh, to Harvard and, and, and he really wants to, to build a, a synthetic inner ear in all its true complexity and has been working to that uh, step by step. And I think his uh, most recent paper, I mean, just reading the title, you know, blew me away. Um, and basically, you know, building the inner ear out of pluripotent stem cells um, and uh, really building skin that can, can actually generate hair follicles, which I think is an amazing level of complexity. And uh, he will explain to us the, the magic sauce of how he actually gets that amazing thing to happen. And uh, I'll, I'll give it to him. Okay, can you hear me okay? All right, thank, thank you, Donna, for the uh, introduction, and thanks to the um, HCA organizers for uh, inviting me to give this talk today. Um, and thank you, Barbara, for the great introduction to organoid technologies and how that can really mesh well with the HCA's, HCA's mission. Um, you did a lot of the introduction for me, which is great. Um, so I'm going to, in my talk, kind of do a deep dive on our work trying to push the complexity of organoids. Um, particularly to generate uh, complex sensory organs, which have been kind of recalcitrant to, to generating in these, these organoid cultures. Okay, and the first point I want to make is that there's more to the nervous system than the brain. You've seen a lot of uh, uh, papers published on generating brain organoids and, and cerebral organoids, um, but I'd like to uh, bring your attention to the peripheral nervous system where we see a number of, of, of sensory organs, uh, including the inner ear, which is the focus of our work, uh, which is uh, responsible for sensing sound and, and head movements and gravity to keep us balanced. Um, <clears throat> and so I just kind of wanted to throw up this conceptual slide up front uh, to get you thinking about the different components of a sensory system and how we might think about trying to generate those from pluripotent stem cells. Um, and, and our goal here is really to build multiple lineages into the organoids. Um, here's a rudimentary sensory organ here. Uh, there's typically an epithelium embedded with uh, sensory cells, like the sensory hair cells of the inner ear. Um, and in three-dimensional cultures, they grow in cysts and form a lumen. Um, another component to a sensory system is the neurons and glia, which are kind of the wiring connecting the system to the brain. Um, <clears throat> and then we, we cannot forget about the support structure, the mesenchymal cells that support these epithelia and, and neuronal connections. Um, and in my group, we've been trying to think about ways we can take pluripotent stem cells, um, aggregate them together in a ball, and generate all of these different components all at once within a single aggregate of cells. Um, but you'll see in the literature, there are other, other groups that are taking the approach of, of generating uh, the individual components and trying to mesh them together. And I think that's something interesting we could talk about in the panel discussion. Um, <clears throat> and indeed, there are missing components to the organoids we generate, uh, such as immune cells and uh, vasculature, uh, which we're trying to now generate in isolation and then integrate into our organoid systems. And, and then thinking even further down the, the, the route of complexity, we can also generate uh, central nervous system-like organoids, like spinal cord or brainstem organoids that can be assembled with our sensory systems to make these assembloids. So our contribution to the field has really been to generate these two systems, the inner ear and skin. Um, and you can see in these videos that we're not just generating the inner ear epithelia, but also the neural connections um, uh, that you'd see during normal inner ear development or skin development. And I'm going to briefly touch on our work on the inner ear and then pivot and talk mostly about our new skin organoid system. Um, so our challenge when we first started working on this was to mimic inner ear development in its entirety. Um, the inner ear is actually a very difficult organ to study. Um, it's encased in the densest bone in the body, um, and it's very difficult to biopsy to, to generate uh, primary tissues for, for culture. Um, so we've tried to start with pluripotent stem cells and re, um, recapitulate this entire developmental, comp very complex developmental process, uh, which begins with formation of these otic placodes 
that thick and patch of epithelium on the surface of the embryo that invaginates to form the otic vesicle that then gets molded like a ball of clay into the vestibular organs in the cochlea, um, which uh, are the organs that contain these sensory hair cells that get knocked back and forth by a, a fluid that runs throughout the ear when you move your head or when sound waves um, enter the ear. And so the key steps when we first started developing this were to generate the otic placode and vesicles. And over the last decade, we've really mapped out this um, uh, differentiation approach, um, trying to mimic the signals that we knew were important for inducing otic placodes uh, just from the literature on developmental biology. And we start by aggregating together stem cells into a ball uh, or a spheroid, and then apply in sequence these uh, differentiation signals. Um, BMP4 is really important for inducing the surface of the embryo, the surface ectoderm. Uh, and then later, um, uh, Wnt signaling is very important for inducing the otic vesicle. But I won't get too deep in the woods on those various uh, signaling pathways. Um, but just kind of generally, we take this directed differentiation approach up into a certain point, and then we allow the cells to self-assemble. And I think that's important for getting this higher order induction. Um, just a couple of features of this culture. Uh, we see co-induction of both ectoderm and mesoderm. So it's a, a kind of a dual germ layer induction. When we first started working on this, our goal was to purely generate just a ball of otic placo that could become inner ear tissue. But we, we found that we could not eliminate this extra germ layer. Um, and it actually turns out to be, I think, an important component of the system where you see both layers of the, the tissue developing together. Um, just a few images from this work comparing, we can compare our organoids back to uh, the mouse embryo and see that there are, um, we can generate the epithelia that gives rise to the inner ear, the otic placode here on the outer surface of the aggregate. Um, and then we see these inner layers of, um, we see some uh, neural crest development and, and then mesenchyme developing. And then jumping ahead to later in the culture, if we cross section through one of these inner ear organoids, we see this uh, structure very similar to an actual uh, balance sensing organ in the uh, mouse inner ear uh, with these uh, clusters of sensory hair cells. Um, and then these epithelia are surrounded by a mesenchyme that we've, through single cell RNA sequencing, we've really uh, determined recently that's a very specific type of mesenchyme that only develops within the inner ear. Um, so looking closer at the epithelium, you can see these beautiful vase-shaped hair cells with protruding hair bundles. Uh, we worked with our collaborators here at Boston Children's Hospital to actually uh, uh, perturb these hair bundles and show that the cells are actually mechanosensitive, similar to uh, the native hair cells in the ear. So the key insight here from this work was that we can partially direct differentiation in three dimensions and then get self-assembly of all these different uh, uh, cell lineages, epithelial, neuroglial, and mesenchymal cells. Um, so kind of pivoting to the, the skin side of our, our work, um, one of the interesting off-target tissues we saw was development of epidermis. So whatever epithelial cells didn't give rise to inner ear tissue, uh, we saw development of uh, that, that epithelia developed into epidermis. And if we kind of remove some of the signals that stimulate inner ear development, uh, we could bias the culture towards generating skin tissue. And uh, because we get that co-development of mesoderm and ectoderm, we saw development of both epidermis, the top layer of the skin, and the dermis of the skin, which preserved that crosstalk and allowed hair follicles to develop. Just here's a cross section through some of our mouse skin organoids. They develop in an inside out pattern. So the hair follicles actually, the root grows outward and the shaft grows inward. Um, and we can label the dermis CD34 and the epidermis with uh, various markers. And we showed that the entire hair follicle development process is really preserved in the system, which is remarkable. And I should point out that all the work I'm going to talk about moving forward was spearheaded by a very talented postdoc and research associate now in my group, Ji Yun Lee. So the key insight here was that um, the epidermis and dermis can be co-derived. And 
this had been a major challenge within the dermatology field. Um, and, 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 and there have been all these experiments in the past trying to merge together isolated epidermal dermal cells and they don't really form hair follicles. Uh, but here we've actually preserved the history of their developmental path and preserve that crosstalk between the tissues. Um, this was interesting from a biological standpoint, but also a clinical standpoint because scars do not grow hair. And so we wondered whether or not we can uh, make human skin organoids. So we developed a human induction strategy. Uh, this time we were successful in eliminating mesoderm induction and just get purely ectoderm to grow. Um, but in place of the mesoderm-derived mesenchyme, we, we now can generate uh, an inner layer of surface ectoderm and an outer layer of cranial neural crest cells. Um, and this combination together is kind of like a recipe for the face. Um, the cranial, mesenchy cranial neural crest gives rise to both neural glial and mesenchymal cell types um, in the facial region. So the facial skin arises from this mix. Um, <clears throat> We showed, we went back to the beginning of the culture and, and kind of re-optimized our approach so that we can generate um, uh, kind of an optimized layer of, of neural crest cells on the surface of the aggregates without this BMP and uh, BMP inhibitor and FGF in, uh, treatment. We don't see any neural crest development. And then with it, we see this nice layer of neural crest arise and it's asymmetry forms with kind of a head and a tail. Uh, we've used single cell RNA sequencing uh, liberally to try to uh, really understand the developmental process. We've looked at different time points. Um, here's at one month of differentiation. We see these three major groups of cells, epidermis, mesenchyme, and uh, neural glial cell populations. And we can use this technique to really compare the composition of cells between or organoids derived from different um, uh, individuals. So here's an embryonic stem cell line and an iPS cell line. Um, and we see a similar composition between the two. So after 65 days in culture, I'll just show you some features of, of the later stages of these organoids. We see this snow globe-like structure with an inner layer of uh, epidermis, stratified epidermis here, um, and then an outer layer of dermis. And you can already see at day 70, development of hair placodes here. And then after 75 days, uh, we see these hair buds, these really nicely spaced, periodically spaced hair buds forming and protruding outwards. And then after 125 days, we can do a whole amount of immunostaining and really appreciate the uh, elongation and formation of these hair follicles growing outward radially from the, from the organoid core. Uh, we have uh, uh, reporter cell lines that allow us to really monitor this process in real time. I use a desmoplakin EGFP cell line that labels the, uh, the uh, uh, super basal layers of the epidermis and the hair follicles. Uh, the hair follicles that arise are pigmented, uh, so we're seeing co-development of uh, melanocytes from that neural crest population, and we can compare that back to uh, 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 fetal specimens. So here's a, a gestational week 18 specimen. Here's a dermis view and can really appreciate the similarities between the hair that's de er, derived here. And we're even seeing uh, dermal fat pads arising similar to what we see in the embryo. Uh, so from that neural crest population, we also see development of uh, sensory, somatosensory ganglia that are innervating the hair follicles. Um, and we're in the process of really trying to understand the functionality of this developing neural circuit. Um, we can take the skin organoids and implant them in a nude mouse model and even see that they, the, the cyst opens up, it blossoms and integrates into the mouse skin and, and forms these outward growing hair follicles as a proof of concept that we could use the skin organoids uh, for reconstructive surgery. So with this system, I think we've really uh, set the stage for investigations into a, a variety of different uh, topics, human development, uh, which I think is most uh, interesting to the HCA community, evolution, wound healing, congenital skin or sensory disorders, skin immunology, infectious disease, and cancer. Um, and so moving forward, I just kind of want to talk about in the last few minutes here, 
Um, one interesting avenue uh, we're taking with this uh, focused on human development. Um, so in the paper we recently published, we, we published two data sets uh, from the day six of this uh, protocol and day 29, about a month in, uh, which we think are roughly equivalent to about uh, weeks two to three and four to seven of fetal development. And we've done additional uh, time points now at 48, 85, and 133. Um, kind of mapping uh, all the way out to mid-second trimester of, of normal development. Um, and so the question is, how well do our skin organoids really compare to human fetal skin? And to answer that question, we've luckily been able to link up with uh, Maz Hanifa and uh, her group, and, and this is spearheaded by uh, Rachel uh, Botting and her group. Um, and as well as Sarah Teichman and, um, and a really talented computational biologist in her group, Ni Huang. Um, and, and very fortuitously, right at the start of the COVID crisis, we, we met up uh, via Zoom and, and I found that they had actually been constructing this fetal skin atlas, uh, collecting samples between uh, week seven and 16 of development um, and, and creating this uh, amazing reference atlas for us to compare our organoids to. Um, <clears throat> and if you look at some of these cell populations, they've captured the fibroblasts, um, some neuronal populations, uh, pericytes, uh, myocytes, and uh, a, a very diverse population of immune cells populating the nascent skin. Um, and so I just want to show you kind of a teaser. Uh, we've, we're still digging through the data, but kind of some of the comparative analysis we've done from uh, comparing our organoids to this reference data set. Um, and it's really revealing major differences and similarities uh, between uh, the organoids and the, and the fetal skin. But the, the kind of overarching view is that the general alignment of the epidermal and dermal cell populations within our organoids really nicely map to normal fetal skin. Um, not surprisingly, there are no immune cells in the organoids. Um, so we think that through this comparison, it, it's, it's a really nice uh, system to ask questions about how the immune cells really influence skin development over time, developmental time. Um, just a couple additional comparisons, looking at our organoid cell populations and the fetal skin populations for the epidermis and hair follicles. Um, we're seeing nice alignment of, of uh, immature and, and maturing basal keratinocytes and, and super basal keratinocytes. As well as, as well as uh, nascent hair follicle populations. Um, and, the, and the main message from this is that we see almost a better representation or better abundance or higher abundance of, of these various cell subtypes within the organoids and can kind of tease out um, hidden populations within the fetal skin data. That uh, the fetal skin data may be uh, less complete than the organoid system. Um, and as, the same thing is, applies within the dermis population, um, where we can see uh, uh, early fibroblast populations, later fibroblast popu populations, and then track uh, development of, of dermal papilla cells, which initiate hair follicle development. Um, <clears throat> and so we're, we're kind of very early in, in sifting through this data, and I just kind of wanted to give you a preview of that. Um, and, and I'll hold the... Uh, the really interesting differences between the, the skin organoids and the fetal skin for another time. Um, but I wanted to end on this slide and, and really drive home the point that I think these organoid models, uh, depending on their complexity and variability and robustness um, and reproducibility, uh, they, they can really serve as uh, models that can fill in the gaps of these developmental uh, cell atlases. So if, if we can only sample uh, actual human fetal skin sam or fetal samples at, at a limited number of time points, the organoid systems can really fill in uh, the, the blanks in between. And so with that, I'll uh, thank you for your attention and thank my group uh, uh, talented researchers that have helped with this work. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Carl, that was uh, both mind-blowing and I was uh, very educated on just how far and um, 
and what and what type of magic we can do in a tube. I, I wasn't aware that, that that well you're you're a true magician. I'd like to thank you know both uh, Carl and, and Barbara for giving such uh, amazing talks. Not only do to their scientific work, uh, you know, nature is like their weekly uh, publishing venue. Uh, but the, uh, you know, the pictures that we saw were so beautiful. They should uh, open an art show in uh, some um, museum of modern art. And uh, now, after uh, the, the speakers will be joined uh, by our panelists. And and before I continue, I, I just want to state that I am I'm just a, a mouthpiece, a puppet. Uh, the true brains behind this operation are uh, Maz Hanifa and Dan Taylor, who are um, behind me and activating the puppet. And uh, just to introduce some of our panelists, first, we're, we're very lucky to have two young, fresh new faculty that have just opened their lab, but are already well-known uh, rising stars. Um, Marta Shabazi, who's at the MRC Cambridge, and uh, she, you know, while the HCA really likes to focus on, on molecules and molecular measurements, uh, she reminds us that there's other things we need to look at, but particularly the shape of a cell and how that influences uh, development. Um, you know, you believe what you see. Uh, Giorgia Cordrado, uh, University of South Cal uh, California, uh, looking at neural development and specifically the impact of neural development um, on uh, neurodevelopmental disorder. Jason Spence from the University of Michigan, and he studies uh, the earlier stages of development. And uh, particularly, I have to state my favorite system, the endoderm, which gives rise to all the most uh, important internal organs of our body. And, and finally, uh, to have a, a computational uh, biologist in play, uh, we also have uh, Aviv Regev, the Leonardo da Vinci of our movement. And uh, she needs no introduction, because if I were to introduce her, I would waste all the panel's time. <laughs> and um, I'd like to start with uh, the first question, which I'm uh, sending to, to, to Barbara. And, and the question is, like, how can the HCA promote uh, multi-collaborations uh, on these uh, organoid studies? One of the goals of the HCA is really to build a community. Uh, these are really challenging questions, and uh, we, we can really solve them together. And, you know, from, from statement and logo and sl slogan, how do, how do we make that into reality, Barbara? So I think in the organoid field, I mean, what is currently uh, the difficulty, I think, is all the different protocols that are out there. And I mean, for some tissues, such as the skin, there's currently one organoid, uh, one organoid protocol out there, and it seems to be a really good one. But for other organoid systems, there are multiple protocols out there, and there are different ways to approach uh, how to engineer a tissue. One can try to co-develop all the parts of, a, of an organ or one can try to engineer very distinct parts, bring them together in, in, in kind of assembloid style later on. And I think um, what would be helpful to bring all the efforts, I mean, I think in the organoid field, using single cell transcript comics as a way to profile what you are making in vitro is now the standard. And so a lot of people are generating a lot of um, single cell transcriptomic are also uh, starting to do a taxi on their organoid protocols. And it would be really great to bring all that together and um, really assess what does every, pro what, what is the advantage of one versus the other protocol. And then um, also find out which is actually the most promising protocol for each of these different organs. I think that would be really a promise of bringing, like of the effort of bringing people together. I don't know if I answered the question <laughs> or if uh, there was something else. Well, uh, Aviv, do you have anything to add to that? Muted. Sorry, I was muted. Um, yes, I, I think uh, another aspect in organoids is uh, in, in Barbara's pro project. One of the projects Barbara listed at the very end of her talk actually addresses that is um, um, inter-individual variation in the very early steps of, I think people who've actually worked with organoids know that there's, there's probably three major sources of variation. One which uh, Barbara eloquently described is the lab protocols. The second is um, even within the same protocol, starting from the same starting culture of the same individual, you're not all, it, it, it doesn't always behave in the same way. So there's probably kinks to be uh, ironed out and there's a big difference between organoids for different organs in that respect. So, so um, you know, 
uh, gut epithelial organoids, which have been around the longest, are definitely tightened up compared to brain organoids. But they're also a very different process biologically, so it might be that one will always be more difficult to mimic in a dish than, than the other. So that's one aspect. Um, the lab protocols themselves and the variation that goes along with them. The, the second aspect is inter-individual variation. So um, we might think that all of these lines are the same. They also have their own issues. They can throw all sorts of CNVs all of a sudden, and actually the line is not faithful. But even when they are faithful, we don't really understand the inter-individual extent of variation here. And again, I think Barbara's project that she described at the last slide would, would address that by doing a larger number of organoids from um, the same, from, from, sorry, from different um, individuals. Um, and then the third source of variation is that organoids is still an artificial system in terms of the signals that we give to the system. So we are trying to actually replace signals that are given by cells with either assuming that the process can become self-autonomous because we have all the components up front, that's more the IPSC model. And in the adult stem cell model, we typically just try to replace signals that are typically given by cells by giving them just in the dish. And that's uh, through secreted factors. And that's harder to mimic and the more the organoids become heterogeneous, which is something that the atlas will help understand, I think the better they would become. So that's from the experimental side. From the computational side, I would say that I think there is a host of questions on how we compare things when they are the same, but not exactly the same, meaning an organoid and, a, and, and, the, tissue from which, um, and the tissue from which it comes are not the same entity. We don't expect them to be identical. But the computational methods that we use still, I think, in the field of single cells in particular, have a challenge with that. That we're pretty good at saying, here are two things that we expect to get to be the same. There's some noise or batch effects and we want to get rid of that. And we're not that bad with things that we expect to be radically different, but that piece where things are kind of similar, but you still expect to find distinctions, I think are still difficult for us across the board in finding uh, discrete groupings, in looking at temporal processes and so on, we have to unpeel more, more pieces and disentangle them. So I think that's a great computational challenge for the community. Okay, the so next... Uh, I, can I maybe add one thing that uh, sure. the, the, the first point, which is the, the inter-individual uh, variation, actually in, in the case of these organoids, it's oftentimes even just the inter- um, clone variability. So if you have multiple clones of one individual, there is even variability. Yeah. And this is not yet fully understood. Uh, why? I mean, in uh, the, the cell states that are being uh, generated are, are quite similar, but this heterogeneity in proportions of cell types that are being generated is really varying even between clones of the same individual. So uh, clones of cell lines of the same individual. So, and, and I would yeah. comment that this could, Barbara, I think this could lead to an extremely fundamental insight into developmental biology, because in the body, this somehow works out and the, the process is faithful and canalized and controlled. And so actually seeing this variation, you can look at it as a nuisance or a, an engineering challenge but I think understanding why we can't mimic nature is part of, of understanding nature itself. And so that's a, a great developmental biology question to be resolved through these means. Okay, thanks. This, is, this has been very insightful. I, I forgot to also thank uh, the audience. There are so many questions and I apologize to anyone that uh, we won't get to because the audience has been uh, on fire and asking a lot of questions. Uh, the next question is, uh, to Carl, since you're such a magician, and what's been the most efficient way for you to extract single cells uh, from these organoids? I mean, your, your hands see magic, so can you share some of that magic with us? The most efficient way to extract single cells? Um, Out of organoids, yes. I mean, there's, there's really not much magic to it. We use the same things that other, other people use, uh, enzymes like uh, TRIP-LE and uh, uh, DISPASE to, to dissociate them. And um, I mentioned Ji Yun Li, my uh, a research associate in my lab. Um, she's come up with a very nice protocol. We, we have slight modifications depending on the stage of differentiation. We find that later in differentiation, the tissues are much more like extracting cells from a primary skin tissue. And so you have to use some tricks to dissociate the dermis and then the epidermis. Um, but 
uh, we haven't put those up on on the web yet, but uh, I think we should probably make them freely yeah. available. Yeah. I, I, it yeah. would be great if if you did, and it would be great. You know, one one thing that the HCA can do is <laughs> is, is 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 really uh, share these methods. And one of the things that's often missing from a protocol is you know these protocols also often assume that life is very perfect and that. Uh, uh, everything uh, works according to plan, and and you know the 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 these protocols often uh, fail to mention the, the 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 magic of what happens. So, what are the typical uh, procedural and analytical pitfalls that you uh, recommend watching out for? I mean, you know, nothing works as planned off a sheet of paper. So, what should people uh, be looking out for to make sure that the experiment succeeds? Uh, yeah, so I think the main thing with these protocols is that uh, one of the issues we've had continuously over the years is that we expect there to be um, some consistency lot to lot when we're buying our reagents as far as recombinant proteins or small molecules and, and really keeping an eye on the, the signals that we're treating the cells with and, and how we preserve those reagents and, and test them. Each experiment, we, we set up a, almost half a plate trying to determine whether or not uh, the FGF's gone bad or is losing activity, that sort of thing. So, so very be, being very vigilant about that, um, that aspect of the culture, I think is, is important. Um, <clears throat> and we also have a, a number of quality control metrics uh, as we start to differentiate the organoids, looking at morphology and, and, um, and making sure that things are on track. Uh, early on in the culture so that you can stop early and not take five months to figure out that you've failed to generate a skin organoid that can produce hair. Um, th these are all very important things. And we've actually, we have a, um, a protocol that we've put up on protocol exchange uh, that accompanied our, our recent nature paper, which has much more detail about the, the differentiation approach and kind of troubleshooting advice. Um, and we're actually in the process of writing up a excruciatingly detailed nature protocol that will be published hopefully in the near future. We, we thank you for that effort. Is there any one of the other panelists that have uh, joined us that didn't get a chance to speak that, that want to share uh, their magic and cooking tips with uh, the rest of the world? Maybe something I would like to add is that uh, for brain organoids at later stages of development, uh, dissociation protocols are really, really important because uh, Asher dissociation can really lead to um, differential damage of cell types that are more fragile, and we have some subtypes of neurons that are more fragile. And so I, uh, so I think that it, it is really important. So there are uh, several protocols out there, but um, as also Carl mentioned, it's also very important to understand that also organize at different stages of development may also um, be more fragile, especially, especially at later stages of development. And so there are some enzymes, for example, that are not really uh, indicated for the for dissociation of, uh, of uh, for example, pyramidal neurons at later stages of development. So um, there are a lot of labs also published uh, very detailed protocol. Um, and uh, there is my paper published in 2017, in which we really detailed um, in natural protocol exchange as well, um, a protocol for dissociation of uh, organs and later, brain organs and later time form. So, but it's, it's very, I think it's a very important point. And if, if I may follow up on that, I think there is not such a like magic protocol that would apply to every single type of organoid. And actually I've seen that depending on the organoid you are uh, working with, uh, you can see that cells modify the matrigel in different ways. So specific enzymes may be better for the specific types of organoids and the same to then separate those organoids into individual cells. So yeah, I think one has to really uh, go for something that would be specific to the model system they are used. Yeah, so actually course, each organoid is different, but like what do you look out for to make you feel that, you know, you like, what do you look out for to make sure that you've done a good job? What, what type of uh, mistakes happen more generally? How do you sort of approach it to say, yes, this, this has succeeded? Um, yeah, I've got a point to, to add in there. Uh, just as somebody who's not well-versed with doing stem cell cultures and wants to 
apply organoids in their research. I think one thing to be aware of is that these protocols, although they're presented as these perfective things, if you read the supplemental materials, most of the time people are talking about all of the, the warts involved <laughs> and how they're not, not really that perfect of systems. And I think it's important to, like if you pick up our protocol and want to generate hair cells, inner ear hair cells, you kind of have to become a mini expert on the developmental steps that lead to development of those hair cells. And you'll need to look at early stages of the culture and, and, and do some characterization, some immunohistochemistry on cryosections or whatever, to really see that the checkpoints are being met as you're differentiating them, um, looking at various markers of, that would indicate otic lineage development. Um, and, and from working with many groups over the years, it, it seems like that that is kind of lost. They think that we can just pick up this protocol and go and, and, and we're going to generate hair cells. Um, but there are a lot of pitfalls along the way. And, and if you're not careful, you'll fall in, into them. If, I'm, uh, if I may add something. So uh, Carl mentioned and, and also Marta, the, the Matrigel earlier, and um, that different lot numbers of different batches of Matrigel um, might be different. And, and I think this is also something where a lot of variability comes in, um, which is, yeah, the, the kind of matrix you provide to this three-dimensional tissue um, in order to grow in three dimensions um, and establish a polarity and so on. And I think here is also an opportunity to, to actually learn um, about what cells actually need. Um, and, and just using Matrigel, um, I, I think this will, I mean, this is the easiest currently, but it's also a very undefined um, matrix. And this is definitely something that, uh, I mean, people like Matthias Lutolf have been, you know, trying to push that and, and uh, really make, defined, and make a defined matrix. And as we try to engineer organoids along these lines, we also learn what, what do cells during development need um, in, in terms of uh, kind of ECM and, and uh, yeah, matrix around them. I think that's so, another aspect that is very important actually. And yeah, I think labs, organoid labs, if one batch of matrigel works, they, they pre-order all the, <laughs> all the, <laughs> the <laughs> models of that matrigel so they can make sure that the organoids will grow consistently in the next months, uh, pretty much like that. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's very clear that the devil is uh, in, in the details and uh, this is another place where the HCA can really help to, to work out and, and share and, and, and optimize uh, these details since there, there seems to be so much that now are sort of in, in the hands of, 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 of these expert labs such as yourself. Uh, there, there's another really Dana, tricky place. Dana, yeah. Can I make a quick comment on this? I think one of sure. the issues with the uh, reproducibility and technical details and comparisons in the past has actually been the, um, the difficulty of distinguishing between compositional and cell state differences. So it's true to Barbara's much earlier point and Carl's point that we can see all the, you know, all the imperfections and we would want to perfect them. But it's also true that it's already much easier to understand what is going on in these kinds of settings because the biggest confounder has actually been the proportions. And once we once we look at single cell resolution, there's a great set of conclusions that we can already make. We, I think it's important people don't get the message wrong that, oh, now we have to go and re-optimize all organoid work before we can do biology. Actually, now we can do a lot of biology that before we thought we can't answer the question because two experiments look so different. Well, they're different in cellular compositions, but they're actually pretty identical other ones. Yeah. Okay. So Moving on to, to the next question, which uh, again is, 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 is um, you know, yet another devilish details. We were talking about all the confounding factors that make these things uh, different, the different uh, matrigel, the, the different uh, genetic backgrounds of uh, the, the source of these uh, cells, as well as, uh, you know, there, there was talking, we're, we're doing a lot of comparisons to find inter uh, individual variation, to compare them into the in vivo data. And at the end of the day, because of so many also technical confounders in, in collecting the data, what, what methods for data integration from these different organoid samples, as well as data integration, along with, uh, for example, the, the, the human uh, fetal samples, do you 
utilize and recommend and, and, and when are you convinced and how do you distinguish between these technical artifact and biological difference? Um, how do you approach this uh, challenging data integration? Who wants to take this one? Uh, Barbara, I mean, you did a lot of data integration, so you can start. Yeah. yeah, I can take that one. I mean, we always try um, all kinds of different um, data integration tools, uh, ranging from uh, anchoring in Surat via Harmony, via, um, I don't want to not mention now any tool. <laughs> in principle, we try all the tools. Um, MNN, um, yeah, and I, I think you can try a list of tools, but what convinces and then and then you choose the one you like best. I mean, what, well, what criteria do you use to say that this yeah, is yeah, the yeah. correct integration? So I think I mean, there are all kinds of different things to watch out for. So one thing is if you profile organoids over a time course, of course, you have different developmental uh, time points that are partially overlapping and um, so you are kind of wishing that these uh, data uh, points will partially overlap. Then um, there are different uh, cell lines you might work with, uh, work with or different, even just from the cell line, uh, different organoid batches. Um, of course, you might design your experiment perfectly to have all the data points from the same organoid batch, but this is not always the case. And then um, on, top of, on top of that, you might have different cell lines and you might have primary data you want to integrate the, the organoid data with, just like Carl Köhler uh, showed. And um, so I think it is a difficult question. When are you over integrating? Um, and uh, when is an integration actually meaningful? I mean, I think one, I mean, it, the, the integration and, and making a judgment whether it's good or not um, uh, will be to I mean will be guided by how you design the experiments. If you have a lot of time points that are close by, then really the the, the time points should be uh, partially overlapping. Um, but by using different integration tools and then comparing them, you can you can at least find out whether there are uh, really strong outliers. Um, or whether the, the tools are performing similarly. And if there's really one integration tool that, that integrates the data very differently, then you, you should look into why is that. Um, but yeah, I think it's a difficult, uh, difficult question. I mean, of course, you want to see data sets overlap. Um, but then you need to look but into yes, the different the, the field questions. suffers from, yeah, the field really suffers often from my experience, uh, a lot of forcing things to overlap when they actually shouldn't. That's one of the number one mistakes I, I see in things I review. Jason, as someone that uh, probably enjoys the most developed uh, systems, both in terms of amount of human data that's collected, uh, you know, directly from the human, as well as the most uh, mature uh, organoid system, do you have any insight into this question as uh, what you like to see as a biologist? Yeah, I mean, I, I was actually going to say that we've definitely fallen prey to the kind of forcing things together when they shouldn't necessarily be forced together. So, you know, I, I think what we try to remind ourselves is that uh, at least when we look at single cell data, we really think about it as a, a hypothesis, right? And, and then we need to go back into the organoid system or into the primary tissue and, you know, do some experiments to validate the hypothesis, to find the cells, to see if they're there at all the different stages that we've that we've been analyzing. And so for us, it's always a back and forth between the bench and the computational work. Uh, and and that, that to me has given me the most sort of confidence in, in our conclusions. Dana, can I, um, can I comment on this? Yes, you always have something to say. Sure, Aviv. So I'll say, I'll say two things very briefly. The first is that I think we need many of our models currently for data integration do not allow for a lot of different batch factors or variables. And so there is that actually underlies the assumption often implicitly made that the only there's only one variable and that variable is experimental batch. That's why things get forced together. But we could have coded a lot of our knowledge, like the time points, the species, all sorts of things into individual variables. And then there wouldn't be as much need to force everything together, but rather to allocate to those what is happening. And the second is that it's very important that these models be interpretable so that you can actually go back and ask, 
what did the model do in order to put these things together? And that gives the tool to the biologists to, I think, Jason's point on what they need to go after for validation. And lack of interpretability in this, I think, is very, very risky for us in terms of biological conclusions. So, you know, yeah, again, think, talking Anna, about- Can I add quickly? Sure. Renata? So I think Carl, you know, had a good example. I mean, I'm biased because I'm involved in this work, but I think Carl had a good example, which was the temporal context of the organoids versus the development. Um, and so in that context gives you a sort of, let's say, um, you know, a, a, a ranking of proximity of the in vitro versus the in vivo stages. And I think that, that kind of contextual information uh, sort of abrogate some of the the need for uh, you know difficulties with batches and data and so on and so forth when you have the you know the in vivo human uh, temporal dynamics versus the in vitro the locations that he was referring to um, spatially in different locations of of skin and so on so it's it's that kind of thing that I think can can guide the computational comparison into a, a quantitative, more, slightly more absolute kind of framework. Hmm. So the next question, you know, again, uh, really focuses on, on the differences and uh, not, uh, rather than trying to sort of uh, minimize the differences computationally as well as, uh, and, and highlight the true biological differences, the, the question is, you know, how can we close that gap? And there's been a lot of discussion that, you know, organoids are, are more simple and, and they're missing, uh, you know, uh, some of the uh, important components that, that we have in, in vivo, such as uh, resident uh, immune cells, uh, the endothelium and circulatory components. So how would uh, you go about, uh, you know, incorporating these uh, into the system? And uh, how would you use the HCA and the data that the HCA is, is, is collecting uh, in vivo uh, from, uh, you know, fr from, uh, you know, humans in order to really guide the, the sophistication and, and building up uh, these, uh, uh, organoids uh, in, in, to include more and more uh, important uh, components. And actually, I'd like to, again, uh, start with uh, Jason, who is, again, working on a system that's uh, very mature. Uh, yeah, I mean, so I think, you know, I think that uh, I'm just rereading the, the question here. Um, you know, I, th I think for us, we have looked at the system very much the way that Carl introduced it, uh, the intestinal organoid system which is, you know, that we sort of, and, and I think, Dana, that you suggested that these cells have intrinsic capabilities. And so we always think about if we can uh, get the system rolling down the hill, will it then have the sort of genetically encoded programs necessary to keep it rolling? And so uh, if, if we can sort of give it a minimal set of factors and then uh, step away and, and let the cells do what they want to do and know how to do. And so we, we spend a lot of our time when we're refining protocols and um, you know, we've recently published uh, some work showing that we can now integrate a, a vascular, a vascular endothelial cells into the intestinal organoid system, and and really it was um, asking if we can give a minimal set of factors for a minimum amount of time to really allow those cells to differentiate at the very early stages of the cultures. And so, um, in in that case, we don't have access to uh, at least with my group, we don't have access to human tissue at that early of a stage, and so. We're, we're really using the human tissue as a benchmark of the end product of, of the organoid. Um, uh, so that's, that's sort of the way that we go about sort of optimizing and refining the protocols as to, you know, uh, it really is sort of trying the minimal factors and then, and then getting out of the cell's way and letting them do what they know how to do. Um, anyone want to add to that great response? Maybe well, uh, think... Carl? Oh, yeah, I was going to say, um... Great answer from Jason, um, <clears throat> and and we think a similar way. Just kind of uh, our job is to get them started and get out of the way. <laughs> but, <laughs> I, I like that motto. I yeah. like that motto a lot. Uh, but uh, I think the he mentioned vasculature, which is a big issue. But also thinking about weaving in immune cells into the organoids yeah. is something that um, I, I, there, there's very few people who have really gone down that road successfully, as far as I know. 
Um, and I think things like the cell atlas that uh, Maz and Sarah are putting together specifically for the skin and then other atlases that are being put together will be very informative in that regard, uh, where we can actually see which subtypes of immune cells are populating a, a given organ and at what time. Um, and then in designing our experiments, if we're thinking about generating specific immune populations in parallel to our organoids from the same iPS cell line, um, we can try to weave in the proper populations at uh, the approximate timing within our organoid system that they would appear during fetal development, that sort of thing. And I, I think we should always use development as our guide when we're working with these models. Um, and that would be one way we could, we could do it. I, I fully agree with Carl and Jason. Um, and also in the brain field, I think, um, in the brain organoid field, this is uh, a way to go to actually for example, generate microglia from the same IPS or ES line that you make the brain organoids from and then allow them to invade the, the uh, brain tissue at a time point that uh, seems most uh, comparable to, to when that happens in the primary um, tissue. And I think it's a great opportunity actually that we have the organoids in that case without immune cells and that we can bring immune cells in because um, kind of this this uh, kind of, um, yeah, ha being able to have it or not have it gives you the advantage to, to find out what these immune cells really do uh, during development and, and what are, you know, like and receptors uh, interactions that are meaningful and how does it help the other, um, the other cell types to develop and mature. So, um, you know, sticking, um, you know, to, to, to this, motif of sort of comparing the human and uh, the organoid system and, and really trying to make sure that uh, they match. One of the reasons that I personally uh, love development more than anything else is it's a dynamic uh, temporal process. And, you know, um, there, there's composition, but there's also timing. So how can we be confident that the relative timing, that the, the, the order and timing of events that we see in these organoids uh, match what we see in human. For example, you mentioned that the, the astrocytes appeared less. Uh, do you know if that's the same case for human? And, and more generally, how can we ensure that not only the final composition, but also uh, the order and timing of events, uh, uh, particularly if we really want to study this development and its regulation is, 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 is really uh, faithful to human? Maybe I can start answering that question. Sure. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a great question and it's an example of how powerful organoids are actually to address uh, the issue of timing. This has been explored, for example, by Miki Ebisuya, and she's shown that uh, the segmentation clock uh, is maintained in vitro uh, when using mouse cells and human cells. So mouse know their time in vitro and human cells know their time. So it's something that actually we can study in vitro and then use these systems to understand the mechanisms. So like Barbara was saying, organoids are great because we can really get a mechanistic understanding. So by comparing the two species, we can really look into the question of tempo in development. Does anyone want to add to that? Um, yeah, so at least for, um, for brain organoids, it's been shown that, um, that uh, iPS cells have the intrinsic ability to um, follow the temporal differentiation timeline uh, that the cells have in vivo, for example, especially for cortical cells, has been shown that the uh, sequence of generation of different subtype of cortical cells mirrors the in vivo development. However, it's been also shown that the timing is a bit altered. So it seems like in vitro, uh, this, um, the developmental timeline is a bit shortened. And so uh, I think this is another, so this is, these are some, there are some earlier, uh, like some um, evidence of this, but I think we really need to um, look more into this. And, and again, having a reference of in vivo tissue um, of the human, with the human cell atlas will be very important to understand exactly how the timing is altered. But it looks like it's in vitro, these events are faster. So the, the next question, you know, um, we, we talked about time and, and let's talk about space, uh, particularly because we're, uh, the, you know, the, the most available technology is, is single cell 
RNA-seq or, or NOOC-seq, which is uh, based on this, uh, this associated cells. Now, you know, um, the uh, spatial technologies uh, are, 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 are getting um, better and better and more accessible and more multiplex. Now, I, I know that when, when I look at the pretty uh, eye candy of organoids growing, there's a huge heterogeneity in, in, in each uh, in, in individual organoid. So, you know, how stable is the spatial organization? Uh, what is stable in, in the different organoids? How can you make it, you know, more, more stable? And, you know, how can you build a, a coordinate framework so that uh, we can uh, go beyond the, 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 the composition and, and cell types and really begin focusing on, on the spatial uh, patterning and organization uh, of, of these cells? And I, I think it would be great if you use um, Marta start uh, since uh, you really talk about shape and, and, and things that you can see by eye. Yeah, so I mean, in, in my case, I work with very early stages of embryo development, and in those cases, the axis is really established by the extra embryonic tissues. So when we are working just with collections of embryonic stem cells, embryo bodies, for example, we may get a polarized uh, differentiation, so differentiated cells in a particular area of the embryo body, but there is not an axis of reference, and I think this is an important issue that this question is addressing. But as long as we have uh, something else included in the organoid, in my case, would be the extraembryonic tissues at the stages that I'm studying, that is already providing an axis of asymmetry that we can really identify um, the axes uh, within a given structure. Uh, so for, for developmental stages, I think that's pretty clear. Then for uh, more like adult organoids, uh, skin organoids or brain organoids, I don't think the axes are so well established, so there would be quite a lot of variability from organoid to organoid. And, and how would you handle that uh, variability? Uh, what, what, what concrete measures do you think we can take to, to use the variability to, to learn and, and overcome the, 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 the variability to find what's similar? Yeah, exactly. And analysis like looking at neighbors and what kind of cell types appear next to other cell types and trying to get like an average kind of organoid uh, that would summarize what you see. So first looking at the heterogeneity and then trying to pull all that heterogeneity into a single unique kind of model uh, organoid. Um, does uh, anyone want to add to that great answer? Um, yeah, so um, I... I like to say that um, self-organizing properties of iPS cells um, have been shown to be great to control, as Dana mentioned, uh, cell diversity, so uh, cell composition in these organoids. But the problem, especially for brain organoids, is that we do not see, um, we do not have in organoids uh, a stereotypic re uh, a reproducible anatomy. And so this is really comes from the fact that there is this consensus in the field that uh, self-organizing properties of organoids control uh, the cell, cell composition and also um, micro tissue architecture. But then in terms of um, uh, anatomy um, and also in terms of uh, controlling the generation of different organ buds, so the number of basically organ primordia that we have in the organoids, uh, basically this seems like um, this is not uh, something that is controlled at an intrinsic level but it actually needs um, control from external factors that we do not have in the organoid. And so how can we uh, control, um, for example, the, num the number of organ buds that we have in, or in our organs, or how we can really try to establish um, more uh, stereotypic connection, anatomical connection, and also um, between different brain regions, for example, in the organoid. So I think that to, to address this point, we really need to use a very interdisciplinary approach. So we, um, I think it's very important to integrate other fields, like for example, tissue engineering, or um, also um, synthetic biology and uh, genetic engineering. We really need to, uh, so in the case of brain organoids, for example, try to generate different brain region and connect uh, the axonal tracts by, uh, uh, for example, um, in, in devices that are um, that can be generated, for example, uh, from tissue engineers, it's it's very important. And so I think it's I think it's very important to think that if we want to improve organoids, we and um, we really need to uh, have a multidisciplinary approach because self-organizing 
properties of organics go just um, can get to us to a certain point, but um, yeah. I'll add to that. I totally agree. Um, and I think, again, we can learn from biology and developmental biology. How does the embryo uh, create these axes? By setting up organizing system, uh, centers. Um, and, and I think by merging different fields, bioengineering and, uh, and the like, um, we're getting better and better at setting up gradients within uh, a cell culture environment and, and being able to create artificial organizing centers. Um, within our system, we're thinking about ways we see development of a head and a tail structure within the skin organoids and we're seeing if we're, maybe we can bias and really um, uh, provide some signals in a directional manner that will uh, make sure that the tail is always developed in one pole or specific location uh, to create more uniformity across organoids. Um, in terms of, you know, computational approaches, do, do Aviv or, or Sarah have something to add here? Um, well, I think this is a great place to, to um, wrap up, you know, because we've had, we've had some discussion of the computational approaches and um, here, of course, the three-dimensional uh, uh, context, the coordinate system essentially of the cells relative to each other comes in, you know, we, I talked about the, the temporal before and Donna, you, uh, you again said, okay, let's go to 3D. And Georgia, I think has made this point beautifully mentioning how the different um, uh, areas of the brain can be sort of plugged together in a microfluidics or other tissue engineering kind of instrumentation way, which I think is, is a, a fantastic uh, uh, direction, you know, also for the organoid network to think about going forwards and um, Marta talked about synthetic biology and I think Barbara already showed us some tastes of that with her crop seek, perturb seek type of approaches um, beautifully kind of dissecting the transcription factors in her organoids. Um, so, so I think that's a, um, a really fantastic place to wrap up this amazing session today. Donna, and I'll hand over to you again for final comments. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that was a, a really great wrap up, so thank you. So uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all of you for, for joining us and, and for all the great questions. And I apologize that we didn't have time to, to address all your questions. They, they were all uh, too amazing and, and too good. Uh, we really, really hope uh, that uh, this thing will um, encourage you to continue to engage with the uh, the Human Cell Atlas, and particularly maybe maybe join uh, the particular working group for for the organoids. Of course, you know this was put together by a team. As I said, I'm only a, a mouthpiece that you know just has a very big mouth. Uh, you know there, there's a program committee: uh, Bruce Aronov, Gary Bader, Ellen Chedidal, um, Muzz, and uh, Dan, who, who who as I said were behind the scenes telling me what to say. Uh, Stan Larson and uh, Aviv and Sarah. And of course, uh, this thing was uh, produced by, by people. They're actually uh, people behind the scenes who, who make this uh, possible. Uh, Kristen Swank that really basically makes everything run. And of course, this is uh, produced with almost no kinks at a high level. So thanks, uh, Scott and Russell from the video production team. And again, uh, a, a massive thank you uh, to, to everyone that's involved. Uh, the speakers uh, who gave phenomenal talks and stuck the time and the panelists who shared amazing insights and expertise with all of us and thank you. And uh, there will be a, a follow-up panel uh, to, to address people who don't enjoy the time zone that, that we in, uh, enjoy uh, for the Australian and Asia. HCA is, is a global effort and really uh, bridges uh, scientists across the entire globe and, and believes in, in equity in every manner, including time zones. So if people want more of this a fantastic thing uh, on September 4th, you can join HCA Asia and uh, there'll be uh, additional uh, speakers and um, involved. And finally, uh, the next seminar uh, will be the last week of October and it will focus on uh, neuronal development, uh, a truly fascinating field. So I hope you will uh, join us. And uh, again, I hope you enjoy today and Thanks for joining us.